Better hide that big ass forehead. <laughs> What's going on guys, Super Insane 18 here, and today I am going to be hitting you with one of the hottest takes I have ever had on my channel, and that is going to be that Ash Blossom is actually the worst hand trap in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh. Now, before you go ahead and click out of the video, let me just elaborate that I mean specifically for this format. Granted, Ash has been incredible in some previous formats, but right now it just feels like it is one of the worst cards you can currently be playing. So in order to prove my point, I am going to be going through what I believe are the best decks, which if you haven't seen my top five meta video, go ahead and check that out. We're going to be talking about Ash's impact or lack thereof on each of those decks, starting from the first to the worst. So let's go ahead and jump on into it. Don't forget to head to insanetcg.com to pick up your double sided metal field center, the fusion summer fun with the design you're seeing on screen. Now it is a limited run of 100 pieces. So make sure you guys pick it up before it's gone. Now, the way that I'm going to be doing this is I'm going to be going over all of the cards that these decks typically play. Granted, all builds are variants of each other, so there might be some that I miss or some that I don't talk about, but I'm just going to be going over the most common ones from each of the decks in question and talking about how Ash Blossom really isn't all that impactful versus them. So first on the list, we have the best deck to beat. That is going to be Cash Tira. Now, I do have a list written out, so if you see me look away, that is what I am doing. I am reading off that list. So let's go ahead and go over all of the most common played cards in the Cash Tira deck that you can use Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring on. So we are going to have Cash Tira Unicorn, Cash Tira Fenrir, Cash Tira Ogre, Cash Tira Theosis, uh, Pressured Planet Wraithsoth, Shangri-Era, and Pot of Prosperity. Now, unless your hand is just absolutely dog water, there is nothing out of any of those cards that you can Ash Blossom that is going to make that much of an impact. So let's go ahead and start with something like Cash Tira Unicorn. Cash Tira Unicorn is able to add a spell from deck to hand, and if you Ash that, it really realistically doesn't matter because they have four other cards in their hand. What if they already opened the Theosis? What if they already opened Birth plus a name? What if they have Planet in Birth? What if they have Rise Heart in Birth? There are so many different combinations of cards where Ashing the Unicorn really just makes you lose your Ash, and chances are that they are still going to be able to play through it. Not to mention the Unicorn effect is going to then be able to rip a card out of your extra deck, and I've seen a lot of people recently forget that without Diablosis, Kashira still has a way to rip extra deck cards in Unicorn, and therefore they are no longer respecting it. Playing one or two copies of cards that they might might want to play more of just to respect that unicorn is still able to rip. At the end, ashing the unicorn really isn't all that optimal. Moving on to Fenrir. Again, it is a case of there are too many cards in the deck that are consistency pieces to allow you to continue playing where ashing the Fenrir realistically isn't a good option. They could have already opened Theosis, they could have Birth and a Name, they could have Rise Heart, they could have Planet. Same argument as Unicorn, there are so many cards that it just kind of feels like a toss up as to what you want to ash in this deck because at no point does the ash ever actually feel good unless the hand sucks. We're not going to talk about Ogre too much. Ogre just adds a trap. I don't think that anybody would ever waste an Ash Blossom on this. It's only on the list because it does have an effect that you can Ash Blossom, but if you are dead set on playing Ash Blossom, just don't Ash the Ogre. Now, with Kashira Theosis, this is probably the best point to Ash Blossom. For those of you that don't know, Theosis says you can only activate it once per turn, and Ash Blossom negates the effect, not the activation. So if you hold your Ash for the Theosis, you can maybe potentially stop them from playing, but again, Again, it really depends on what they have. Any combination of birth plus a name or the field spell, any combination of rise heart plus birth, there are just so many options, but this is probably the best choke point to hit in my opinion, because they won't be able to use another one if they have it. It makes them waste the card as well, and they don't get the free special summon, so go ahead and let them search it off the unicorn. Once they activate it, Ash Blossom it, this is probably the best place to Ash, but again, it just really isn't impactful because there are four other cards in their hand, and with the consistency of Cash Tira, chances are they can still Still put another name or two on board. Pressure Planet Rate Soft is probably also a really bad place to Ash Blossom. All it does is let them add one of their Cash Tira names from their deck to their hand, and again, unless the hand is absolute duty, there is no way that they are only relying on that one monster that they search. So you can go ahead and Ash it if you want, but again, four other cards in hand still leaves them with enough to play. Shangri-Era might be a really good choke point for Ash Blossom if they are going for the Wombo Combo board. It prevents them from getting another Fenrir or Unicorn during your standby phase, but at that point they probably also have a Rise Heart, maybe even a Big Bang set as well as some form of other interruption, so ashing that effect just 
kind of gets rid of one thing that they didn't really need because they already have their setup. So again, it just really feels unimpactful. And for the final card out of that list, we have the Pot of Prosperity. Again, you can see the trend here. They have four other cards to play with, and if they really, really needed that Pot of Prosperity, they were probably losing the game anyway. The consistency of this deck just means that hitting any one of these cards isn't really going to be impactful. I've seen it time and time again, and in fact, in Locals the other week, or what was it? It was actually last week. The only game I lost was because I essentially lost to myself. I Ash Blossomed on the Theosis. The Unicorn ripped out one of my extra deck monsters that I really needed because I wasn't respecting the Unicorn, and had I just not had Ash Blossom, I think that I would have won that game. Moving on to Sprite, we are going to read off of the list of cards that Sprite can typically play that also are able to be hit by Ash Blossom. So we have Fenrir, Water Enchantress of the Temple, Sprite Jet, Sprite Blue, Nimble Angler, Nimble Beaver, Melfi Caddy, Pot of Prosperity, Sprite Starter, Fateful Adventure, Gigantic Sprite, and Sprite Sprint. Now, that is a lot more cards that are Ashable than we had in the Cash Tira, but let's go ahead and again just go down the list, starting with the one that we started with, Fenrir. Obviously, this isn't something that you want to Ash because it is just an extender for the deck. At worst case scenario, it is a monster that they can link into a Sprint in combination with another level 2. At best case scenario, it is an additional interruption on their end board. There is never a reason to Ash this if you are against Sprite. Water Enchantress of the Temple. This is for the adventure engine that some of the decks are playing, and honestly, probably not the card to Ash because they still might have opened the Rite of Aramis here. If you're going to Ash anything in the adventure engine, it is probably the search off of Fateful Adventure, uh, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Enchantress just really isn't that good of an Ash target, especially because if they are able to put any level 2s on board, they can still just full combo. The adventure engine is just a way of putting another form of interruption on their board, so you don't really care about that. You want to stop the more impactful cards. Here we're going to talk about Sprite Jet and Sprite Blue at the same time because they both serve a very similar purpose of searching one of your sprite cards. In the case of Jet, it is a Speller Trap, and in the case of Blue, it is a Monster. Now, unless the hand is, again, absolute, completely horrible, neither of these is really a really big hit. The ability to just put any level 2s on board to full combo is super strong, so chances are if they're active, well, not chances, they have to if they're activating any of these unless summoned specifically off starter, they already have another level 2 on board, which they used to allow the special summon of these cards, and therefore ashing these isn't going to do anything, because then they just take it with the other level 2, make a gigantic or make a sprint, and that would have been a much better ash target, albeit I don't think those are good ash fodder either. Uh, again, we'll get there when we get there, but you probably don't want to ash these cards, because at the end of the day, it's just going to open you up to getting full comboed on, because that's what all of these decks do. All of these decks are still able to full combo you through Ash Blossom, which is why I'm making this video in the first place. Going a little bit out of order here, we are going to talk about Nimble Beaver. Now, Nimble Beaver is able to special summon a Nimble from your deck when it is normal summoned, and that could be potentially a good Ash target, but if they have any sprite name in hand, then you wasted your Ash Blossom and they are still going to full combo, because the idea is if you normal summon Beaver, you're going to summon Angler from your deck, and then if you Ash the Beaver, they still have a level 2 on board, meaning that if they have Blue, Jet, Carrot, Red, Pixies if they play it, they're just going to go ahead, special summon it because Beaver is a level 2, and still full combo you, and you just hand looped yourself for that one card, which would have been better off being pretty much anything else. Next we have Angler, and I think Angler is probably the biggest choke point for an Ash Blossom in the sprite deck. For those of you that don't know, Angler, when sent to the graveyard, is able to special summon 2 Nimbles from your deck. Typically you are going to summon 2 copies of Nimble Beaver after you send Angler to the graveyard off of something like Sprint. Now, the unfortunate part is that Nimble Angler isn't once per turn, so if they have a way to send another Angler, then it doesn't really matter, and that is one of the reasons why I don't think Ash is that great in this matchup, but if I have to Ash Blossom, this is the card that I'm going to be Ash Blossoming, typically at the point where they Sprint. Sprint is their only monster, and if you Ash the effect of the Angler, they can't get anything else on board unless they open specifically Starter, Carrot, or Red. Carrot and Red are the ones that summon when you have a Link 2. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Fires summon on Lynx and the Darks summon on Xyz. So yeah, if you Ash the Angler, they need pretty much the perfect hand to continue going, but a lot of times they might not need it either because they have so many other extenders in their deck, and that's really all you need is any extender, because if they go for the Sprint play first, then any other level 2 that they're able to put on board, they can just overlay the Sprint and the level 2 into a Gigantic, and at the end of the day, again, you wasted a card in your hand. Now, Caddy is one of those cards that you can Ash, but similar to Cash Ogre in the pre 
previous discussion, uh, you probably would never want to Ash it. All that it does is let you add a beast from your deck to your hand, and yes, that does open you up to getting an Omni Negate on board by searching the Penny and using it to Synchro into a Herald of Arclight. Uh, at that point, it is your turn. You have six cards. There are better things to do. I would rather have that Ash Blossom be something like a Board Breaker, an evenly matched a Dark Ruler no more, uh, because if you had the Ash Blossom, you were probably using it on your opponent's turn one, and they wouldn't have gotten to the Caddy. Well, potentially wouldn't have gotten to the caddy. I still think that pretty much every deck is able to full combo through Ash Blossom, so again, it's just really one of those things that you don't want to hit with the Ash. Pot of Prosperity, same as with the Kashtira matchup, unless they really had a bad hand, they don't need that Prosperity to resolve. The chances of opening full combo are exponentially higher, and the Pot of Prosperity more often than not is just digging for additional interruptions. At least that's how I play it when I play Sprite. There's been very few scenarios where I have bricked so bad that the Pot of Prosperity was the only saving grace, so yeah, you don't really need to waste your Ash on that either. Bright Starter is one of those hits that always seems super tempting to hit with the Ash Blossom, but again, all Sprite Starter does is give you an additional level 2 on your board, so unless your hand was absolute garbage, that additional level 2 does not matter. Chances are they have a way of putting 2 2s on board, and if they can put 2 2s on board and you've already used your Ash Blossom, you are getting full comboed. They are putting up minimum 4 to 7 negates, and you're just not going to have a good time because now you're playing down a card that could have been better used for something else. Fateful Adventure, again, is part of the Adventure Package, which is seeing a lot of resurgence in the Sprite deck, and this is probably one of the better hits because it prevents them from getting something like Wandering Griffin Rider, and for those of you that don't know, Wandering Griffin Rider can equate to two interruptions on your opponent's turn as well. What a lot of people are doing in this current format is they are holding the Griffin Rider in their hand, opting not to summon it on turn one because they feel that they don't need the Omni Negate immediately, and what that allows them to do is play around something like Dark Ruler no more because you can dark roller no more and then after it resolves they can special the griffin rider to then have an omni negate on board as well but more importantly you can also use it whenever you want to activate an effect like sprite sprint sprite sprint is able to go ahead and bounce a card whenever a monster is special summoned so you can activate that at your own will by choosing when you want to special summon your wandering griffin rider so by ashing the fateful adventure you can keep them off of potentially two other interruptions but again if you save your ash for that chances are they're putting four other interruptions on the field as well, in which case I would rather that Ash Blossom be another board breaker, again like Dark Ruler or Evenly. Gigantic Sprite used to be the choke point for Sprite, but as of late it realistically isn't anymore because a lot of decks no longer need to rely on it, they are still able to put an additional level 2 on board, even if you Ash the Gigantic, and then they'll take the Gigantic in the level 2, link into Sprint, Sprint send Angler, Angler summon two Beavers, both Beaver into Melfi of the Forest, and then you're just at the same exact point that you were previously, the only thing that that does is maybe keep them off of something like a uh, Ibli Lock, or if they really needed to summon the Jet to get the Double Cross. Um, so you are getting through at least one interruption, but they are still pretty much full comboing, getting something like the Herald of Arclight, as well as the Sprint Bounce and the Melfia Forest Negate. So it really just depends. Again, if the hand is really bad, then yes, Ashing the Gigantic pretty much feels like a death sentence, but there have been very little hands in which that has been the case for me. I'm usually able to extend past it, and again, it just feels like a waste of an Ash Blossom. And finally, we have Sprint. Sprint is able to send a level 2 from deck to grave, which is an Ashable effect, and 9 times out of 10 they are just going to be sending the Angler, but we already went over that I believe Angler is the much better hit, so just let the Sprint resolve. If you have the Ash, Ash the Angler and hope that they don't have an extender. Now, moving on to the deck that I think is the only deck where Ash has a relatively significant impact, and that is going to be Branded. So here we have the list of all of the cards that Ash Blossom is able to hit in Branded, but we're not going to go over all of them because there are only two that really need to be gone over. We have the Bestial Lubellion, Albion the Shrouded Dragon, Bestial Sarnir, Aluber, Kit, Quem, Mercurier, Tragedy, Nadir Servant, Fusion Deployment, Branded Fusion, Foolish Burial, Branded Opening, Grang Nual, Dusk Dragon, Albion the Branded Dragon, and Despian Lulu Wat Lilith. Now, the only two cards that we realistically need to talk about are Branded Fusion and Nadir Servant. You've heard me say it on the channel before, Ashing the Branded Fusion is a pseudo FTK. I don't really feel like any of the plays that you can make through an Ash on the Branded Fusion are worth playing in the current format until we got the Nadir Servant combo. For those of you that don't know, Nadir Servant combo in, co in uh, combination with something like Dogmatica Maximus still lets you set up the Puppet Lock through the Ash on the Branded Fusion. It is a one card gimmick Puppet Lock and that is incredible, so those are the reason that these are the only two cards that I want to talk about. So 
so if you're against specifically branded, yes, Ash can be very impactful, but that is one deck out of the top five, and we're not just talking about the top five here. This is a very, very mixed format, very, very diverse. There are so many decks other than these top five that you can expect to see if you're going to a regional or higher event, especially going into the North American WCQ, which is where I'm going to be in a couple of days from the time of recording this video. So yeah, it's just, if you're against specifically this deck, Ash could be argued that it's good, but this is the only one. And again, with the Nadir Servant combo, Ashing the Branded Fusion isn't even as impactful as it once was. You're still going to get Gimmick Puppet locked, so why not play something that is better suited to handle that, like, I don't know, maybe like a DD Crow to banish the Gimmick Puppet, or a Ghost Bell to negate the Albion, or Forbidden Droplet, even though that's not good in Cash Tira, it's really good against this as well as other decks. There are just so many other better cards to play than Ash Blossom against the specific deck. Moving on to Labyrinth, there are three cards that you are able to Ash that are typically played in the Labyrinth deck, and that is going to be Ariana, Welcome, and Big Welcome. And we're just going to go through this really quickly because I'm going to tell you that it is not the Labyrinth engine that scares me, it is the Floodgates. I am terrified of cards like Skill Drain. I am terrified of cards like Punishment, which can keep me off of my level 2s since I am playing Sprite. I am terrified of cards like Gozen Match, Rivalry, Eradicator, all of these big just super impactful trap cards that aren't Labyrinth in name, but are able to see play because Labyrinth is a trap deck. Yes, if you keep them off of their engine, chances are they're going to run out of gas eventually, but unless you have a way to handle those floodgates, so are you. So you would rather play cards like, I don't know, Cosmic Cyclone or uh, Harpy's Feather Duster or Lightning Storm, and those cards just feel 10 times, maybe even more impactful against Labyrinth than the Ash Blossom would on any of those three cards. And to finish things off, we are going to be talking about Vanquish Soul. Now, let me go over the list of cards that you are able to Ash and Vanquish Soul and then talk about it a little bit because this is one of the interesting ones that I wanted to talk about. We have the Heavy Borger, the Cash Tier of Fenrir, the Raisin, the Mad Love, the Reinforcement of the Army, the Stake Your Soul, and the Pot of Prosperity. Now, I can't really talk too much about these because Vanquish Soul is something that I don't have a lot of experience playing against. I've played against it, I think, three times, beaten it twice, and lost once, and I'm not sure how impactful Ash ashes in this matchup. Obviously, ashing cards like the Raisin and the Mad Love can keep them off of their either big monsters or important spells, which could potentially be good, but again, they have four other cards in their hand, and that is the theme of this video, is that at the current moment in time, every single deck that is seeing top meta level play is so consistent that keeping them off of a single search or a single summon nine times out of ten isn't going to be enough to just win the game or even make their board less or more manageable rather, because even if you're getting rid of one of those things, they can still full combo and then you're just staring down the exact same board. But yeah, Vanguard Soul is one of those ones that I'm not really too sure of the impact on, just because of my lack of experience. If you want to talk about it down in the comments, I would love for you guys to tell me what the best moment to Ash versus this deck would be, but that is going to be Vanguard Soul. So where does that leave us? As I've said, unless all of these decks are opening absolutely horrific hands, Ash Blossom does nothing for this format. So I would rather that be a plethora of any other card. Against Kashira, you could have something like a Book of Moon or an emergency control or enemy controller or just so many other board breakers. Same thing against Sprite, you could have a Dark Ruler No More or an Evenly. Against Branded, you could have something to prevent the puppet lock that Ash Blossom probably isn't going to do if they have a decent hand. Especially because now that there is a one combo or a one card combo with Nadir to uh, do the puppet lock, you're seeing a insurgence of cards like Triple Tactics Talent to draw cards because now you Ash the Branded Fusion, oh, if I don't have the Nadir Servant, I'm going to draw into it. Or Thrust, if you already have a monster on field, they can just flat out search the Nadir Servant uh, against something like Labyrinth. Again, I'm not scared of the engine, I'm scared of the Floodgates, and with the Vanquish Soul, again, I don't know the full impact, but that is just from my lack of experience. So if you are going into a regional, if you are going into a last chance qualifier, if you are going into the North American World Championship, 
Championship qualifier, maybe consider do not play Ash Blossom. I just think that there are so many more one of impactful cards that will do so much more for your game plan. You won't feel like you're just losing out on advantage. You'll feel like you have a much stronger card to help you play through your opponent's established board. We are in a format where you don't want to prevent the board, you want to break the board, and Ash Blossom simply doesn't do that. And there you guys have it. That is going to be my hot take on why Ash Blossom is an absolutely horrendous card this format. I want to hear your guys' opinions down in the comment section below, but please be polite whether you agree or disagree. Go ahead and give me your reasons for either side of the coin. This is a very different video than I normally do. I don't typically do discussion videos like this, but wanted to give it a crack because this is something that I am very passionate about while talking to the people that I am preparing for Nats with. This is a very high contention point between us, so I definitely want to put this out there. You guys know the deal. If you liked it, make sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell, like, comment, share with your friends, maybe consider supporting me on Patreon. Don't forget to pick up your Fusion Summer Fun double-sided metal field center. It is a limited run of only 100 pieces, again, so make sure you get that in the uh, link in the description to my website. And as always, check out the channel sponsor, Dueling Guard, using my code INSANE18. You can get 5% off your entire purchase. Thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Thank you